uh, you know, a few weeks ago, although I had seen the Musam um, show. Um, but maybe that's good because in some way uh, we've been immersed for a few minutes in, you know, the, the, the visual repertory of the GPRA and, you know, Algerian nationalists. And to, stay, to take a step back and remind ourselves um, to what extent our, our relationship to, uh, you know, to the uh, French colonialism and also to the war of independence has been mediated by French images, by the, the photographs, the, the paintings of um, administrators, scholars, settlers, tourists, <clears throat> soldiers during, um, during the war. Um, so um, uh, the French, this French appropriation of of land of the territory of Algeria, was also, <clears throat> excuse me, a confiscation of the image and a confiscation of the gaze and the look. So, given this, the photographs of Mohamed Kwasi bring before us a crucial perspective one that is largely absent from the visual archives of colonialism and even those of decolonization. Today at Brown and in the coming days at Columbia, we'll explore the specificity of this perspective, those features of Kwasi's photographs that reflect the, political, the particular political investments and affective ties, the forms of access or lack of access that resulted from his status as a Francais musulman or sujet indigène in French colonial terminology. These political and affective dimensions are, of course, interwoven with his aesthetic and compositional choices. I'm going to speak for a few minutes about the project of self-representation that his photographs undertake. And then I'll turn to the question already introduced um, very beautifully by Gemma of how we view these photographs today and more specifically, how we view them alongside more recent images of domination and resistance in Algeria. Kwasi's body of work brings us in the midst, into the midst of the Algerian war as viewed and experienced by those who supported and fought for independence. His photographs of the training drills of the ALN, the committee rooms where the GPRA deliberated, or the social gatherings of Algerian students, the Ujema, with the international supporters, a product of his access to sites which French or international photographers would likely not have been, into which they would likely not have been admitted. They are images that respond to what Stefania Pandolfo calls the, confis the colonial confiscation of place by depicting Algerian men and women inhabiting spaces, inhabiting <coughs> roles, from which they had previously been excluded. If French colonial propaganda depicted Algerians as helpless, downtrodden, as peasants, or as terrorists, Kwasi's photographs provide a visual counter-narrative that presents them as well-trained and disciplined soldiers, students, educators, doctors, negotiators, diplomats, and journalists. And I think this connects with what Adel and Safia were talking about before, um, which is to say that the four sections of this exhibit, visions of a war, visions of a people, visions of revolution, visions of a time past, offer a view of the period from 1954 to 1962 as much more than seven years of armed conflict they highlight also the work of nation building, the diplomatic effort to project Algeria onto the world stage, and the depth of popular political engagement. And it's particularly significant that they foreground interactions among Algerians rather than those between Algerians and their French antagonists. Okay, a little too far. Go back. Two other things stand out for me in looking at Kwasi's photographs. One is his deorientalizing approach to Islam, which registers as an important feature of Algerian society, but not as French colonial ethnography had interpreted it as a defining mentalité. 
Take, for example, this photograph depicting soldiers performing prayer. It's an important image because of the subtext that Algerians could, at the same time, be effective and disciplined soldiers and observant Muslims. In this respect, the photograph also strikes a different chord than representations of the Algerian cause in sympathetic international media, which often overlooked the place of Islam, highlighting instead the revolution's leftist and third worldist ideals. In a similar way, Kwasi's photos cut through Orientalist framings and French wartime propaganda about the status of women in Muslim societies by de and, in, and in Algeria in particular, by depicting women as soldiers and as militants. And I know that Sophia Mo is going to enrich our understanding of those particular images later on. The second thing I find very striking is that while there are plenty of images of the leading actors of the FLN, some of whom would go on to lead Algeria after independence, these photographs are more often organized around collectivities than individual figures. They capture moments of collaboration and debate rather than constructing profiles in individual heroism and leadership. I think it's because of their somewhat oblique, somewhat offbeat quality that Kwasi's photographs remain so vibrant today. They provide a rich occasion to celebrate the 60th anniversary of Algeria's independence, while also bringing new layers to our understanding of how that emancipation was <coughs> achieved and what that emancipation has meant. Yet we also have to be mindful that, Alge that images of the Algerian revolution have often been co-opted to legitimize political authoritarianism and economic predation. One of our early decisions when we were organizing these events is that we would resist the anti-colonial form of nostalgerie by bringing Kouassi's photographs into dialogue with later historical moments and other situations of oppression and resistance. A shared visual grammar connects many images of the 1950s and 60s to the demonstrations that exploded in 1980, 1988, as Jamal was just talking about, and the more recent protest marches of the Hirak, also discussed uh, this morning. In each of these moments, photographs have documented people's assertion of the right to inhabit and move th freely through space. Alongside other visual artists, photographers have fought to wrest control of the visual field away from hegemonic representations and technologies of surveillance, technologies of surveillance that, of course, try to inhibit people's uh, ability to participate in demonstrations. But how exactly we bring images of different historical moments together calls for some reflection. Juxtaposing images of French domination to those that disclose the authoritarianism of the Algerian state, uh, and I think quite a, quite a few such juxtapositions have been circulating um, during the Hirak. Uh, these juxtapositions capture significant and tragic parallels, but they also risk evacuating the meaning of the revolution. So with this question in mind, I think it's the question of the, the parallax, uh, in fact, I thought it would be interesting to consider two projects that bring photographs of Algeria at different historical moments together and to consider why and how they initiate this comparison. Both of the projects that I will speak about also play with the juxtaposition of image and text. And as an aside, I would maybe say that photo books and photo literature have become um, such a dynamic and, and crucial genre in Algeria in the last dec decade or so. Um, I think there are a number of reasons for um, their appeal. Um, one being, of course, the, the particular work that photography does between memory and history um, in, in a national context that's you know, really saturated with commemorations of the past and where the question of the relationship between image and narrative um, has a, a particular intensity. I mean, there are other things to say about the photo book in Algeria, but we'll just say that for the moment. So the first work that I want to touch on briefly is a presentation of photographs by one of Algeria's great French language writers, Mohamed Deeb. Um, in 1946, Deeb, uh, equipped with a Roloflex camera, 
took a series of photographs of his hometown, Tlemcen, in Western Algeria. Five decades later, in 1994, these photographs were published with an accompanying text by Deeb under the title Tlemcen ou les lieux de l'écriture. A new edition was published last year by Barzakh, the most dynamic imprint in, in contemporary Algeria, together with Image Plurial in Marseille. So what did Deeb photograph in 1946? The corpus largely consists of photos of the courtyard of, or the patio of his family home, as well as neighborhood landmarks such as the communal oven or the four banal. He also photographed the cemetery and a few architectural features, as well as some portraits of his family members and other acquaintances, mostly children. Though Deeb was clearly um, preoccupied with composition, the photographs nonetheless have an intimate feel. They're very different to Kwasi's much more spontaneous images, but they also foreground the lives of colonized Algerians. The editors of the new Barzakh edition, Sofian Hajjaj and Salma Hilal, write in their introduction that Mohammed Deeb is likely one of the first Algerians to have captured the life of the Algerian people at the time. His photographs contain almost no reference, almost, almost no trace of the colonial occupation, although they were taken just a few months after the French authorities had brutally suppressed demonstrations in eastern Algeria, a repression widely seen as the catalyst for the independence movement. They make no allusion to this conflict or violence. On the other hand, as I think you can see from the, um, the image of the grouping on the, the patio, they definitely play with the tropes of Orientalist painting. Now, you know, I see a reference here to Delacroix and all of the, um, the works that play with Femme d'Alger dans, dans leur appartement. The text that Deeb composed in 1994 to accompany the photographs has been characterized by Anissa Quell as a photobiographie. And indeed, in a manner similar to Roland Barthes in La Chambre Claire, it insists on the profound connection between memory and photography. Deeb connects places that appear in the photographs to his published writing, threading passages from his novels into his commentaries on the photographs. In a review for Middle East Eye, the great journalist and, and writer Adlan Mehdi writes that in Deep, Deep's photographs put before us a lost pre-colonial world, even though, of course, they were taken during the colonial period, you know, right at the, the aftermath of um, Stief and Galma. But, but this is really not the whole story because the accompanying text also gestures in very subtle ways to the changes and losses that had occurred since 1946. Deeb notes, for example, that some of the places that he had photographed then no longer existed in the 1990s. The Marché du Madressa, for instance, was blown up during the War of Liberation because it was suspected, and this is what he says, it was suspected to be a refuge for terrorists. Deeb's use of the word terrorist in this context is striking. FLN fighters were, of course, often designated by the French military as terrorists, but it's nonetheless a term that in 1994 carried a new and more proximate set of associations. So in addition to Deeb's photographs and texts, the 1994 edition includes a second set of photographs taken by the French photographer Philippe Bordas. These uh, photographs mostly revisit the locations photographed by Deeb including the family patio, and I think taking Deeb's use of chiaroscuro to an even more dramatic extreme. But they also echo Deeb's work in the sense that though they were taken in the midst of the Civil War, just a few weeks after the, um, the Procureur General of Tlemcen had been publicly gunned down, they also betray no trace of conflict or violence. Um, so interestingly, the new Barzakh edition dispenses with Bordas' um, photographs, and I can certainly see why, because it's not, it's not immediately clear what they add. The pairing of two series of photographs of roughly the same places reveals that perhaps little had changed 
although the patio looks shabbier and more in need of repair than it did in 1946. Is the point to signal the resilience of Tlemcen's architectural and culture, cultural heritage, or to point to the relationship um, between, um, sorry, um, or, or to point to the need for repair and modernization, I'm sorry. In the absence of any guidance about how to interpret the relationship between these sets of images, Bordas's photographs seem to hang in the air as a kind of uncanny pendant to the earlier series by Deeb. So we often say that images of the past haunt the present, but in this sense, I would say that the opposite is true and that the images of the past are haunted by those of a later era. Or to put this maybe more abstractly, I would say that those images are haunted by their own futurity. Um, the second work that I want to consider is somewhat different, though it also involves the pairing of a prominent Algerian writer with a French photographer. So, Sonoy Domama, Algérie 1961-2019, published by Barzakh in 2019 and featured last summer in an exhibition at the Institut du Monde Arabe, centers on the work of the photojournalist Raymond Depardon, who in 1961, when he was just 19 years old, documented the final weeks of French Algeria, as well as the peace negotiations in Evian, where he was one of the only French journalists to be given access to the Algerian delegation. I'm sure that he came into contact with Safia, so I'm interested to to hear uh, about that. The photographs that Dupardon took in the spring and summer of 1961 are paired in this book with a commentary by Kamil Daoud, one of Algeria's best known and certainly most controversial writers and journalists. Uh, and then there's also another second set of photographs that Dupardon took in 2019 when he re returned to visit Algiers and Oran in the company of Daoud. Like Mohamed Kouassi's photographs, De Pardon's are extraordinary, but for almost diametrically opposed reasons. Where Kouassi placed Muslim Algerians in the center of the frame, De Pardon depicted two populations living side by side, but without interacting. Using symmetry and contrast, his compositions ca capture the choreography of missed encounters at bus stops, street co crossings, and public benches converting abstract social relations into memorable images. De Pardon was also attentive to the walls of Algiers, where the graffiti of the OAS um, floated alongside announcements for the immediate sale of the homes and businesses of the departing um, French European uh, population, and posters advertising concerts and movies. It's an extraordinarily ironic uh, image. As Kamil Daoud notes, these poignant contrasts testify to the resistance of daily routine in the face of looming violence and the imminent prospect of radical change. De Pardon's photographs lead Daoud to reflect on what decolonized Algerians see when they look at photographs from the colonial past. Qu'est-ce que je ressens, moi, décolonisé, quand je contemple une photo de cette époque? Qui suis-je dans ce miroir qui devrait me refléter? To counteract the permanent erasure of the colonized in the eternal present of the photograph, he imagines himself reborn as a background figure in one of de Pardon's photographs. Je m'imagine réincarné en... Yeah, sorry. Je m'imagine réincarné en 1961, debout dans un angle mort, penché à une fenêtre, traînant dans une rue d'Alger, jetant un regard anxieux sur, sur une roumia, Crapahutan, come back to that term, <laughs> um, sur la colline Pelay. J'invente ma propre possibilité de vivant à cette époque. Daoud rightly admires de Pardon's attention to background figures, an aesthetic that he also embraces in his work, including, of course, his, his break, breakthrough novel, Morceau contre enquête, which revives the, the anonymous Arab Muslim characters of Camus l'étranger and pushes them into the foreground. Uh, J'adore scruter les passants en arrière-plan de photo, les gens de dos, les ignorés, les faux flâneurs. Leur énigme reste entière malgré la banalité. Les passants anonymes ajoutent à l'événement une sorte de métaphysique, d'infini, indéchiffrable pour toujours. On dirait qu'ils rôdent sur le dernier rebord du connu. 
Daoud is well known for his provocative positions on social and political issues, and it was inevitable that he would see in Dupardon's photographs an occasion to comment on Algeria's trajectory since independence. If he imagines himself as a background figure in colonial Algeria, he also claims to feel like an invited guest in the Algeria of today. Je suis un revenant, yes, je suis un revenant, un fantôme. J'ai accepté le pacte inhérent au récit national. Les morts sont les seuls à avoir un corps, puisqu'ils sont les seuls à l'avoir perdu. Rien ne m'appartient dans ce pays. Tout revient aux morts. The feeling of being dispossessed by a national mythology that privileges martyrs over the living is worked out most explicitly in his commentary on De Pardon's sequence of photographs of the Algerian de delegation in Evian. In this passage, which takes the form of an imagined interview of Kamel Daoud by Daoud Kamel, he confesses that when he looks at these photographs of the Evian uh, agreements, he feels an almost Pavlovian sense of patriotism. But he also says that he feels tired of patriotism and wants, him, and wants to liberate himself from the liberators. By way of example, he says, and these are the photographs, Uh, yeah, so by way of uh, uh, example, he says that this would mean feeling free to direct his gaze away from the faces of the heroic liberators towards ostensibly trivial background details. So when um, Daoud Kamel asserts that l'histoire ne, ne peut pas être ignorée, Kamel Daoud replies, certes, mais mon histoire non plus, la mienne, mon histoire à moi. Tout comme mon droit à l'instant de laisser mon regard s'attarder sur les rideaux de la résidence, du bois d'Avo, ou sur les motifs du tapis, ou des tapis, ou sur l'herbe um, figée du parc. So Daoud seems to be proposing that to emancipate oneself from grand narratives of history, one must be able to look at photographs of the past against the grain, dwelling on material details that at first glance seem unimportant. And this is perhaps where his version, his vision, converges with Mohammed Dibs, which, as we saw, is, um, of, affords a really privileged place to the observation of place, patterns, uh, and textures. So I find the interweaving of Dupardon's photographs and Daoud's text to be very powerful. Uh, in fact, it performs some of the work of Kouassi's photographs by introducing the perspective of the colonized into the colonial image. It could certainly stand alone without the addition of the later set of photographs. Yet clearly the collaborators in this project, so Daoud, de Pardon, and the editorial team at Barzac, felt that it would be important to juxtapose images of Algeria on the threshold of its independence to photographs of Algeria today. This decision, of course, raised the question of what de Pardon would photograph and what he was being asked to bear witness to. As in 1961, Dupardon seems to have been captivated by his observation of life on the street. His recent photographs manifest the same playful eye for symmetry and contrast that was the signature of his earlier work. They also seem to me to be unified by some recurrent themes, including, above all, gender relations, the place of women in Algerian society, and the relationship between local and global, traditional and modern. At the beginning of his text, Daoud observes that la, photo la photographie est une interprétation. Elle n'a rien d'innocent. Photography is an interpretation. There's nothing innocent about it. And indeed, these photographs are products of interpretative lenses that are often applied to Arab and Muslim societies. These themes of the photograph are certainly reinforced by Dawood's commentary, which, and I'm, I'm going to really simplify a great deal, um, so bear that in mind, but I think one could say that they cast contemporary Algerian, Algeria as a society that is both repressed and repressive, and yet in which one constantly encounters beautiful surprises, happy couples, groups of friends, the smiling faces of attractive women. This perspective is again quite consistent with Dawood's wider viewpoint and his, and his persona as a provocative critic, not only of the system, 
but also of the social and cultural norms that he, you know, he sees as being characteristic of Muslim societies. As the work of Kwesi and Deeb uh, illustrates, photographs communicate not only by what they depict and foreground, but also by what they don't choose to show or foreground. In the case of Sonoy Domama, perhaps the most notable absence is the Hirak, the uh, anti-government protest movement that erupted in February 2019. I, I really don't know how the timing of Dupardon's visit corresponded to that of the Hirak, so I, I need to set aside the question of whether he could have photographed protest marches as well as street scenes. It does, however, seem noteworthy that Kamal Dawood mentions the Hirak only in a very brief aside in which he attributes the fact that Dupardon, as a Frenchman wielding a camera, was welcomed with smiles rather than hostility. Um, so he attributes this welcome to the healing of Algerian self-image that the Hirak had induced. So this, this positive but fleeting reference um, to the protests, again, tracks with a broader reticence um, toward the Hirak on Dawood's part. Uh, and here, there's, you know, a lot has happened since 2019, and he said a lot of things, so it's hard to, it's hard to really summarize. Um, but I, one thing that one can say is that um, it would disturb the vision that he presents of Algerian society to focus um, the text on the Hirak rather than on um, the images that uh, de Pardon captures. So um, in the guise of a really fast and um, very, very cursory conclusion, um, it seems to me that the two examples of the parallax that I have considered um, show that juxtaposing photographs from different historical moments can pr productively destabilize the representation of the past by helping to demythologize it and by creating space for complexity. By contrast, in these comparisons, it is the image of the present or the more recent past that appears the more challenging and potentially subject to didactic interpretations. Thank you. by Sophia, who's a PhD candidate in the French Department of Columbia and a co-organizer of this whole event here in Columbia. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for attending today. So we've just heard two really fascinating presentations on you know, how photography was used as a tool to construct this shared history, this shared cultural heritage. Um, and I want to just start by asking, you know, whether anyone in the audience has questions for either Madeleine Dobi or uh, Gemma Mazuzi. Yes. Uh, hi, Madeleine. Thank you so much uh, for the talk. I was so struck by the parallels between these. Uh, sorry, I was so struck between uh, the parallels between these books of photography and the films we watched yesterday, and particularly your remarks about. Uh, images being haunted by their own futurity. The first film we watched by a Cecil Dequigis distribution of bread, its commentary came decades later. And as a function of that, it invests these images with a deep melancholy, right? It kind of saps through all of their revolutionary fervor and really digs into what's um, the despair and the everyday in these images with a certain kind of historical hindsight. And I'm wondering if, and you, know, you mentioned at the end of your talk, the ways in which looking at these images, oh, thank you so much, uh, from the present allows us to sort of see through myth and look at their complexity. But I'm wondering if that always has to manifest itself as a kind of melancholy, right? Which is maybe one of the dangers of looking at these images retrospectively. We know what happened historically. Is it also possible to pull out little utopian fragments from these images as well, if that makes sense? I think in the way that you phrase your question, um, you, you, you answer it as well, because you introduce many elements, not all of which are, are the same. Uh, the, the word melancholy is very helpful, for example, in thinking about what's going on in the deep Bordas text, um, not least because the 
Bodas pro does produce some images that are um, that are not the same places that that Deeb um, photographed, and really dwells on the cemetery, the whole kind of necropolis, um, uh, you know, architecture of uh, Tlemcen. Uh, so there is there is a, a deep sense of melancholy there. Um, but I, I I would agree that that's not necessarily the only affective, affective and political um, emotion that can be tapped in these um, these juxtapositions. To me, I think the there's there's a question of equilibrium. I I do think that quite often when uh, you know when recent works revisit the Algerian Revolution. It is with just this very deep sense of disappointment, melancholy, brokenness. Um, so the question becomes how to retain from the past all that was important, inspiring, resilient, with, you know, without just kind of lapsing into um, melancholy or also um, you know, uh, really a, a feeling of um, uh, you know, since the images have been so often co-opted for political purposes, cynicism is the other other possibility. I'm thinking, you know, for example, of um, Malik Ben Smail's film, um, you know, Bataille d'Alger, un film dans l'histoire, which really situates that film in its broader historical context. I mean, you can walk away from that fil film feeling profoundly disgusted, <laughs> um, but I think that that is also it's a relative, I'm sorry, relative position. And um, uh, I don't think it should uh, it should summarize the the kind of relationship that is is possible. So one of complexity, one in which different notes are it's possible to sound different notes. Um, seems to me the right you know the right way of thinking about this. Thank you so much. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, Professor Azoulay. Uh, J'ai une question pour toi. Tu as parlé de, du danger de la photographie dans les années, début des années 90, mais on ne peut pas ignorer que le danger existait aussi au moment de la révolution en Tunisie. Alors, est-ce que tu peux élaborer un tout petit peu sur le danger de la photographie, uh, surtout en uh, voyant certaines photos photo qu'Adèle montre ici uh, ou d'autres, quand on voit comment ils devaient se cacher, n'est-ce pas Donc, quand les photographes, ils, ils arrivent, par exemple, dans les lieux uh, où on garde les blessés, il y a un moment de danger. Danger pour les photographes, danger pour les gens qui sont cachés. Uh, si, si tu peux élaborer un tout petit peu sur le danger de la photographie uh, en Tunisie à ce moment-là. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, just a question is um, sort of going back on, on uh, the comments that were made by Gemma about the danger of photography and the danger of visibility um, in the 90s. Um, of course, thinking about the fact that photography uh, has a sort of holds a danger of its own uh, prior to that and and um, during the, the period in Tunisia, just the same, especially because of clandestine activity, um, the fact of photography, of, of taking the f uh, pictures of people who are in hiding, for example, um, the gathered um, the gathered wounded um, are photographed and this is uh, uh, dangerous activity both for the photographer and for the people being represented in these images. So if you could just elaborate on the danger of photography in this way. Okay, merci. Uh, ça marche? Si, ça marche un peu. Uh, en fait, je me suis mal exprimée. Je me suis mal exprimée parce que uh, ce que j'essaie d'amener, c'était cette question uh, de, de, de fossé, de fossé uh, intergénérationnel entre... Uh, ce qui s'est passé après, après 62, cette institutionnalisation de la photographie et le fait que, euh, avec le parti unique, c'était pas non plus très facile de prendre des photos n'importe quand, à n'importe quelle heure, n'importe où. Euh, et donc, dans ces, cette fin des années 80, avec cette, cette ouverture démocratique de la presse, etc., et tous ces nouveaux talents qui arrivent aussi euh, pour essayer d'écrire ou de prendre des nouvelles photos, euh, il y a quand même, euh, de la part de la, de la nouvelle génération, 
euh, un espèce de procès quand même qui se fait sur cette institutionnalisation et donc une image en fait de, euh, du fait que les photographes officiels, Kouassi aurait pu apparaître comme un, à un moment donné aussi un photographe officiel, euh, il a quand même photographié des, des, des présidents euh, avait, avait comme euh, et c'était pas tout à fait le cas hein, parce que euh, Kouassi aussi il devait aussi lorsque j'ai le livre avec moi euh, ce qui était très intéressant, c'est de voir comment il aimait la ville, les villes, et comment il, euh, il, il travaillait aussi aux images de la ville et des, et des gens dans la ville. Et il fallait plein d'autorisations pour pouvoir photographier. Euh, Aujourd'hui, c'est encore plus compliqué. Mais voilà. Donc, euh, mon idée, ce n'était pas de, donner, euh, de, de comparer justement avec les photographies pendant la guerre elle-même, parce que pendant la guerre elle-même, euh, Safia pourrait en parler, euh, les documents, on les cache, ça dépend sur quel territoire on est. Donc pendant longtemps, euh, Safia et, 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 et Mohamed sont aussi, euh, euh, travaillent euh, sous le manteau aussi euh, pour la Fédération de France du FLN, et il y a plein de documents qui peuvent passer et que, euh, dont ils ne vont jamais parler, euh, des documents, des photos qui vont être prises et qui vont passer sous le manteau, et qu'il euh, faut absolument, de cellule en cellule clandestine, euh, euh, faire avancer justement ce type de documents. Euh, donc mon idée, ce n'était pas du tout de parler de ça. Et, et d'ailleurs, ce n'est pas un contexte que je connais très bien. Euh, euh, ce, ce que je connais, c'est ce que racontait Kouassi euh, concernant justement ce cadre euh, du bureau. En fait, il a, ils avaient un bureau quand ils étaient à Tunis et le GPRA avait posé ses pénates et ils, ils étaient quand même... Euh, euh, il, il pouvait fonctionner comme une vraie administration parce que c'était ça qu'il fallait faire en tant que pour gouvernement provisoire. Donc ce n'était pas du tout la, le contraste que je voulais donner. Mais c'est la complexification justement de, de, du fait de faire des photos en Algérie à différentes périodes. Ce n'est jamais facile, ça n'a jamais été facile et surtout de faire les photos qu'on veut. Et, et bien sûr, si on est journaliste de presse, photographe de presse, on a, on a non seulement ces cartes de presse, mais il faut des autorisations, il faut des autorisations. Et si on a juste un appareil photo, ben là, aujourd'hui, il y a des photographes qui sont un peu frondeurs. Et, et bien sûr, c'est des photos volées, d'ailleurs pas aux gens, mais des photos volées dans l'espace public qui n'est pas un espace libre, qui n'a pas toujours été un espace libre. Il y a des poches, c'est complexe. Il y a des moments où, où plein de choses sont possibles, des fois où, où la, la répression se referme, en fait. Yeah, so thank you for your question. Oh, no, um, <laughs> thank you for your question. I, I maybe expressed myself not so accurately before. Um, I didn't mean to draw on a contrast um, between the uh, sort of dangerous status of images during the war itself and then later. Um, what I meant to draw attention to was the uh, ways in which post-1962, the institutionalization of photography um, created a sort of generational rift um, in the late 80s with this kind of democratic opening of the press and the new talent influx that comes in, um, there is a sort of trial um, and, and criticism of the institutionalization of photography and official state photographers, um, of which Kwasi could have been part, um, even though that's not entirely accurate, um, but he did take you know, uh, presidential portraitures and, and, and things like that. Um, in the end, when we look at his work, we do see that a lot of his work is also taking um, images of cities um, and, and sort of urban landscapes for which so many permissions were necessary um, and, and uh, on top of press cards. So it's not so much a comparison to the war itself, where of course um, undercover imagery was happening and then the transfer of these images from cell to cell is an entire context that is not the con context that I'm most familiar with. Um, my particular expertise is more in, in the um, what I learned from Kwasi about the frame of the office space and the GPRA um, and the ways in which the provisional government um, sort of acted as an administrative body. Um, Um, so it's more about then complexifying the question of image making in Algeria, which has never been a simple task, um, and the different levels of authorizations that are necessary, um, because up until then and up until now in different forms, um, photography is always kind of stolen photographies. Um, the theft isn't the theft to the people who are being photographed so much as the taking over of a public space, which is not Um, public insofar as it is free um, and the right to photography is a, is a very controlled uh, uh, access. Adel, go ahead. I, uh, I have actually so many questions, but I'll keep it simple. Um, it's a question to both uh, Madeleine and Jamal. 
Um, there, I wanted to, to ask you about the, the status of sorry the, the, the status of images and photography itself because I feel there are two things that sort of connect in the presentation that, that you did. There's this idea of a land grab, which is also an idea of you know uh, uh, image grab at the same time, and also it's a takeover of the space. Uh, and it's the, the, the process of the colonization. So there's this relation that I feel both of you have, have put on the table between the image, but the land and the space. And I'm interested in what it means and what, the, what, what is photography in that context, in the context of space and in the context of land. And the second question is about image and death, actually, because there's all this, uh, um, all this process of life and death that is taking place, this idea of revisiting that Madeleine you know, has been talking about, the moment of the 90s that Jama has been talking about, and uh, this idea of uh, uh, photography capturing the living, but also capturing the living as they are in the process of dying, and then visiting these spaces. So what is the original photography actually doing in terms of interacting with this, this sort of like tension between life and death, and, and how does uh, uh, reinterpretation, what, what is the difference really between these images that were taken and then these new images that are being taken, and, and what is the relation to acknowledging the death or bringing back life. And I think there's a tension there that you brought up that, it, that is interesting. So to both of you, if that makes sense. Wow. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Please. <laughs> well, I, I'll start by saying a couple of things and then uh, hand over to Gemma. Um, I think that the two questions are connected through the, you know, the fundamental indexical quality of photography, right? That, you know, photography has, has a specific relationship to place. It has to be taken in a, a certain place at a certain moment. So it, it's always going to, to index that moment, that place, uh, even when it's, you know, mass reproduced, uh, you know, viewed many years later and across the world. And similarly, in relation to, to life and death, it's going to record a moment of life or the moment of death, you know, potentially, um, even you know, beyond the, the, the death of the people represented. So the, I think the particular, the, you know, the, the capacity of photography to stand as silent witness, you know, to, um, you know, to be this uh, prosthesis of memory, to you know, all of the, the particular roles that we you know, that are very specific to photography and people attribute you know, to photographic projects are there and they bring together your, your two questions. Um, but yes, I mean, I think we see, you know, in the, in the different periods we've been speaking about, so colonize, you know, colonialism, um, the confiscation of, of place is also a confiscation of the image of the place and the way in which the place is represented. And the repossession of the place is certainly also a repossession of the image, the right to inhabit, the right to look, the right to look at oneself. You know, so all of those things go together, and they're articulated again in a chain in 1988, in the early 1990s, and and the same thing, same thing today. You know, the the right to inhabit public spaces, the right to um, you know, to photograph, to represent those demonstrations the way one wants, and then the you know the counterpower of of surveillance and way that that is being used, you know, to you know to target people. Um, these are these are all connected. That's a quick thing before Jemma, because one thing that you said about the pardon was very striking about Kwasi is that from what I know from the Kwasi archives, so, you know, maybe it exists. The only pictures of the French that I know are at the border you know, holding that door. Basically. That's the only time I see them in this, you know, in this whole archive. Yeah. And so they, they're really uh, uh, reluctantly reopening this space for the Algerians to come back. And then the photos of the independence, if you think about that, is really the photos where the Algerians are reclaiming uh, that space, right? And they're reclaiming that space, which is what we call independence at this point. The <coughs> photography is, do, is doing that work with the, with the space. And I was interested that the pardon had this sort of like two tracks, you know, like uh, that you were talking about. Because I, maybe Jamal would know, but I don't know that in Kwasi, you don't see the French, right? You see them like in the, in the, 
at the border. That's what I know from it. Well, désolé. C'est bien. C'est-à-dire ça, ça, ça pose des questions. Donc je, 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 me, je me souviens plus vraiment, mais c'est vrai, c'est une absence. Euh, c'est une absence qu'on pourrait voir. Merci Madeleine. Merci <rire> d'avoir euh, comme euh, repris. J'ai bien aimé votre, votre intervention. Euh, Merci d'avoir repris en fait les choses parce que la question de la hantise, la, vraiment la question de la hantise est, est, est toujours là, c'est-à-dire les, les images qui sont créées euh, ne le sont jamais à partir de rien, ce serait comme pour le langage, il y a déjà quelque chose qui est là, euh, qui est retravaillé parfois et redonné à, 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 à comprendre et redonné à ressentir, donc dans le moment où, 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 où surtout après on reçoit la photo, et euh, une photo, euh, elle est aussi traversée euh, pour la personne qui, qui la regarde de, de ce que la personne est déjà. Donc, il euh, y a quelque chose du chronotope, pour prendre deux, deux, deux éléments de, de Bartine. Donc, question du, du chronotope, c'est-à-dire la, la question vraiment du, du, de l'espace-temps en, en entier qui fait lieu commun. Euh, et donc, euh, euh, la photo, justement, c'est le lieu et le moment euh, d'où on prend la photo et donc de ce qu'on a choisi de découper et qui va construire quelque chose, ou rappeler quelque chose, mais être déjà hanté par, par quelque chose. Et, et ne serait-ce que parce qu'on n'est pas vierge, chacun et chacune, lorsqu'on regarde des photos. On a déjà des images euh, dans la tête, euh, des images fantasmées, ou des images qui sont déjà là, des images traumatiques, des images du passé, des images familiales, des images ima même imaginaires. Et puis la deuxième chose, c'est la question justement du dialogue, euh, il, y a, il y a quelque chose qui, qui, qui est proposé par la photo. La photo est d'un don aussi, donc euh, la photo est offerte, la photo, la photo s'offre. Parfois, elle s'offre difficilement, ça dépend euh, effectivement de comment on la reçoit. Donc, c'est cette question de la réception. Je oui, vous laisse, ouais, ok. <rire> donc, en fait, euh, pour essayer de répondre, en fait, euh, c'est vraiment la, 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 la question de la, de la manière dont... Euh, en fait, les... alors là, je vais sauter, en fait. c'est-à-dire que je suis d'accord avec la manière dont, dont Madeleine, euh, en fait, apporte justement cette perspective sur, sur à la fois, la, donc aussi ce que j'ai dit, la, 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 la réception et le, et le don de la photo et comment, comment on reçoit la photo. Et pour la question des points de vue, ça aussi, c'est très intéressant, c'est-à-dire qu'on doit revenir à la question coloniale toujours et jamais s'arrêter à la question de la guerre. Donc, à la question coloniale, qu'est-ce qu'a fait le colonialisme en termes de dépossession, de dépossession de soi Et donc, le travail de Kouassi, c'est un travail euh, titanesque, comme tous ceux qui euh, vont se leur relever les manches, euh, euh, qu'ils soient au GPRA et ou ensuite euh, en train de lutter, ou ensuite en train même de mourir, euh, en, train, en train de se donner, finalement, ensuite... Euh, en 62, à, à faire un pays avec euh, pas grand-chose, en fait, parce que faut se rappeler de, de, des conditions dans lesquelles euh, les Algériens se trouvent euh, pendant, la, pendant le colonialisme à, à, aux diverses périodes. Donc, il y a une, un effacement de l'identité algérienne. Il faut tout faire, il faut tout faire. Et il faut tout donner, il faut construire, il faut euh, fabriquer, il faut... Euh, euh, et en même temps, ça existe déjà, parce que le tissu, le tissu traditionnel, le tissu culturel existe, il est là. Mais peut-être la différence, justement, avec les, avec les protectorats euh, euh, tunisiens ou marocains, c'est que les Algériens, on les a détruits. On les a détruits et euh, ce trauma... Ce trauma collectif, moi, je crois qu'il n'est pas terminé. Je veux dire, euh, il n'est pas terminé. La dette coloniale est encore là. Euh, ce n'est pas fini. Euh, les Français vont nous dire « Ouais, mais c'est bon, ça fait 60 ans ». Mais non, 60 ans, c'est très court. C'est très court. Tout est très court, en fait, quand on regarde dans la profondeur même euh, des viols et des dépossessions et des violences subies. Ce n'est pas fini. C'est réifié. C'est encore là. Et tout est à construire quand Kouassi fait ce travail-là. Il ne termine pas. Et, et aujourd'hui encore, on, on, on a d'autres formes de, de revendication de cette construction de soi qui prend différentes formes, différents modèles, différents souffles d'ailleurs, différentes dynamiques, différentes, euh, euh, différentes sèves aussi, parce qu'heureusement, euh, les gens ne sont pas les mêmes, les générations se suivent et il y a toujours d'autres rêves aussi. Alors euh, oui, il y, y a des rêves qui continuent, mais il y a des rêves qui sont autres. Et c'est aussi euh, pourquoi le clash intergénérationnel n'est pas obligé d'arriver. Il peut aussi... 
veux dire, il y, y a des questions intergénérationnelles qui, qui portent en fait la fameuse lettre euh, dont parlent les psychanalystes. Finalement, euh, il, il y a du trauma, mais pas seulement, mais il y a pas mal de trauma colonial. Et ça, on, on va trop vite à l'effacer. On va trop vite à l'effacer. On arrive d'ailleurs aux années 90 à laisser assez allègrement en, en effaçant la dette coloniale, mais elle n'est pas finie cette dette. Alors. <clears throat> so, uh, thank you for the way that you brought together all of these elements. Um, the first two elements to put down on the photographic question is the question of hauntedness, uh, a hauntedness that is sort of intrinsic to the image making process. Um, and we could say that it is in, in, in two part because images are never their own beginning or they never start from themselves, both in the choice of the frame and in the instant of photography and in the reception of photography um, uh, by the by the um, uh, uh, spectator of it, which brings us to the second sort of point, which is the point of the, the dialogue um, between photography as a gift, as a present, and its reception, um, all of which is, is sort of underlined by a chronotope to, to continue um, to, to use Bart Bartesian uh, jargon, which is the, the, the sort of common space and time, um, which is diffracted in the eyes of each um, spectator of photography who is never uh, a blank slate in their reception and, and and the ways in which images come to mingle with um, uh, the images that each person carries and the traumas that each person carries in watching them. Um, so these are sort of the two elements. Um, uh, and and um, Gemma is in agreement with Madeleine's perspective um, on um, th these questions of the gift and the receptions um, of photography um, and the different points of views. Um, and, and the fact also of always coming back to the colonial question um, beyond the question of the war um, and asking and understanding what disposition dispossessions were effectuated by the colonizers um, to really truly sort of weigh the gigantic work at hand um, done by Kwasi and, and everybody that he was working with um, in terms of um, understanding the material conditions within which the Algerians worked and, and the utter dispossession um, that was affected at that time from which the work started. And so there, there's a bit of a tension between both um, this absolute devastation, um, but also the, the existing um, uh, fabric, the existing uh, uh, social fabric that was then worked with, the difference with the other sort of surrounding protectorates being the level of destruction in Algeria. Um, and and this 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 um, uh, the absolute sort of nature of this violence, which 60 years on uh, um, uh, still exists, um, and the colonial debt has not um, uh, been expunged. Um, and despite the better uh, uh, wishes of the French government, that sort of uh, has this this uh, wish to m to move on. But we see that until today, in the Im in the the tradition of image production, um, the emergence of of different um, utterances and and breeds of um, dreams of self-construction that continue to struggle in this way where the um, generational, um, the lineage of these concerns aren't necessarily a in a relationship of antagonism and generational clash, but also have sh this shared concern that we can that we see continue to be iterated to this day um, in, in the question of uh, self-construction. Thank you so much, um, Madan and Jamal, for your responses and uh, Asya for your translation. I just wanted to bounce off of something that Jamal said about you know, this drive to uh, reconstruct Algerian identity um, in the aftermath of the end of uh, colonization. Um, as someone who has studied the Al Mujahid archives, I was really struck by this kind of textual trope of, you know, going back to the original personality, uh, la personnalité originale de l'Algérie, um, that comes up again and again. And I see photography as being linked to uh, this, uh, this nostalgia, but also this desire to create something new that is also um, something old at once. So this mixing of temporalities. Um, Bianca, I don't know if we have time for one more question or if we're out of time. We're probably good for one, more. one more question, anyone in the audience? Yes. yes. <clears throat> uh, thank you again for your uh, both interventions. I have a question, especially uh, because you mentioned uh, that you cannot forget the colonial element or the <laughs> colonial uh, condition. So I wonder, uh, maybe it's a question addressed to you, uh, Madeleine, regarding the use of uh, 
about in relation to Algerian photography regarding the, uh, what I conceive as the unproblematic way of the pardon editing this book. Unproblematic or unproblematizing because it doesn't ask questions about his role as a French being in Algeria in the 60s, uh, taking those photographs and uh, Jama, your term of photography or the photograph is a doll, is a, a gift. It's also a theft, right? It's also a theft not only in the way that you describe it in relation to the Algerian government, but in the way that the French uh, dispossessed Algerians from the condition from the photographic conditions since the very, very beginning. And very beginning, it's even before the invention of photography. And I'm thinking about uh, Longlois and uh, uh, Camera Obscura yeah. and the way that this participated in actually offering Donné uh, Alger to the French uh, during their invasion. And using Bart in connection to Algerian photography is using actually a colonial uh, apparatus to relate to photography. There was a striking moment in Safia's you know, uh, uh, dialogue with Adel when Safia said, I was not there actually, right? Algerians were in Tunisia. When uh, uh, the independence took place, some Algerians were still not there, right? There is a different speciality, a different geography, which is the geography of the colonized that exceed the uh, geography or the speciality that Bart defines in Camera Obscura as the one coherent place where the photograph was taken, the indexicality. The indexicality is what enabled colonialism to invade Madagascar, Senegal, Lalgeri, uh, India, etc., etc., planting in our uh, uh, imaginary this idea that the photograph is related to the place, erasing that this place is being colonized. So I wonder, it's not exactly directed to you because you brought bar. it's a question, how can we think about uh, Algeria or about colonized, uh, colonized places outside of the theory of photography that is inherently colonial? It's maybe not a question, maybe it's a commentary to uh, end the conversation, or I would appreciate if you can respond to how we can think about it. Thank you. <laughs> oh. um, je peux y aller, c'est difficile. C'est difficile et très, très uh, pertinent. Um, en fait, c'est des questions, uh, ce serait des questions... Euh, en fait la déconstruction devrait aller effectivement quand, quand on parle de déconstruction il faudrait aller regarder tous les cadres et ces cadres là s'ils sont des cadres coloniaux même les cadres sociaux s'ils sont coloniaux effectivement on commence où et donc euh, je crois que le, le travail euh, les, le, la, la, le, le projet justement colonial est là pour effacer il est là pour effacer y compris effacer son propre alibi de colonisation, donc effacer les traces. Et, euh, et c'est vrai que euh, euh, ça fait partie de sa violence et de ses conséquences. Donc il euh, y a de la perte, je pense qu'il faut reconnaître qu'il y a des pertes, que de la perte et des, des choses qu'on qu ne recouvrera pas, même s'il y a du recyclage, même s'il y a des tentatives, même si euh, euh, on peut euh, dé dessiner des... des des, euh, des fantasmes de l'origine à chaque fois. Euh, je crois qu'au présent, ça se passe toujours au présent. -dire le, le, on évoque le passé toujours au présent. Et donc c'est toujours à refaire. C'est-à-dire, euh, selon, selon les responsabilités politiques du moment, euh, il, il y a des, des, voilà, à la fois de l'action et de la performance à avoir, et euh, selon les questions et les, et les moyens du moment. Et parfois, euh, ce n'est pas possible. Et parfois, on n'a pas, pas justement euh, la gentilité. La gentilité n'est pas forcément là. Et euh, je sais, en fait, c'est une question vraiment ouverte. Je ne la, je la prends pas personnelle, évidemment, mais je l'intègre je, je dans, dans mes façons de, de questionner justement des cadres de pensée qui sont irrités, euh, notamment aussi, ou des impensés qui sont des impensés coloniaux. Donc ça, euh, ce n'est pas facile. Et merci pour la question, c'est pas facile. <rire> um, 
Yes, it's a it's a difficult question and a very pertinent one, pertinent one, um, because of course the question of the inherited frames and the frames of thought and unthoughts of coloniality um, are always present. And the question is, you know, when where where do you begin the work when the the tools of deconstruction that you have are themselves inherited? Um, and I think that trying to think along this process, um, recognizing that erasure um, is a large part of the colonial work. Um, erasure of its own alibi of colonization, um, which has, um, which bears its own violence and then consequences, um, and and accepting or or at least sort of. Uh, um, uh, understanding uh, the fact that there is going to be definite loss, um, that in all of this process of erasure, no matter the work that is done to salvage, um, some things have been erased for good, um, no matter how much we indulge um, in fantasies of, of, uh, of, uh, solve, of uh, the salvation of an origin point, um, there there is, um, there is a way in which calling upon the past is something that is always done in the present for the needs of the present situation, and this is a perpetual work of a, the reactivation of that history. Um, and in that process of activation, sometimes agency is lacking. Um, in certain situations, it is; in situations, less so. And so, these these questions are very complex. I integrate th I integrate them to my thinking and my work. It's an open question um, to, to 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 yeah to think about the the, the colonial thoughts and on thoughts of the heritage of this critical um, uh, tradition of thought also. Um, well, so, I mean, as you know extremely well, the, the whole question of the, the use of theoretical frameworks, whether, you know, parallax, chronotopes, you know, the, the whole, all of these apparatuses in, in relation to photography from Algeria, you know, there are, there are many questions about that, but I think what I, I would take most of all from your um, your question is the potential for um, you know really for the erasure of the the history of photography beyond its European you know its well known European history um, and I think that the the De Pardon I mean what's interesting is you know it, it's a, an exhibit it was very successful at the Institut du Monde Arabe. And of course, it centers on the work of a French photographer. And you know, we could ask whether there would be a similar exhibit, you know, featuring the work of, of Mohamed Kwasi at the Institut du Monde Arabe. I think that's a, a very legitimate question. Um, in terms of the indexicality, yeah, I mean, I think that the that's both the the power and the the danger of the photograph, right? That it it is connected to a time and place, but. Um, what what we see is is you know what we see what we interpret and not everything that is not photographed excluded what is outside the frame on the margins of the frame so it's kind of why I ended by saying you know <laughs> uh, photographs speak by what they don't show as well as by by what they by what they do show um, so I you know I certainly I, I wouldn't um, I don't think we can dispense with the idea of the indexicality of the photograph even despite you know all of the ways in which contemporary art has played with that, you know, that, um, you know, that dimension. Um, but, you know, the questions that you're asking about what the, the particular kinds of frames, exclusions, um, dominations of the visual field that colonialism has entailed are, you know, exactly, exactly right. Thank you so much, everyone. We will have to take a break here. So we are going to have lunch, and we will be back in this room at 2, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you so much.